when we can come into the house of the Lord. When you make that statement, you always have to think about David. And David came to a point in his life where he said, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Our, let us have a prayer. Father in heaven, dear Lord, you brought us safely here and we're thankful. There are many more that's on their way. We're praying for them, dear Lord. And we, we just want to have an enjoyable time in the Lord today. This is what we came here for. We came from far and wide, dear Lord, just to lift up the name of Jesus. Jesus said, if I be lifted, I'll draw men. And we're just so thankful this morning. We come for this portion of the program where we'll study your holy word, dear Lord. It's a good message there. Uh, we all have had a peek at it, but maybe we can glean a little bit more as we go forward. So... We ask that you bless this morning. The Holy Spirit be present there, Lord. Lead us, guide us, direct us. Show us how to bring honor, honor and glory to you. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Our opening song this morning, I think it says something about he lives. Let us stand. Rejoice, rejoice, oh Christian. 
been for a little while then. Our scripture this morning, hope I can see it. Can we read it together? Revelation 12 what? 10. 10 and 11. Okay. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. You know, I put a little thought together this morning. I didn't title it. Fast forward. I better not get into it early, but I just want to tell you though, that God says He's the Alpha and the Omega. Amen. Now we weren't. We learned about fast forwarding to our technology over the years. But how long has God been fast forwarding? Hmm? Ever since he had a prophet in he could go anywhere in time and tell you what was happening. And he always made sure that he contacted his servant, the prophet, before amen. he did anything. Amen, amen, amen. Well, anyway, if I get a little time, I'll say something about it. If not, uh, we move forward. He's telling me that I need to build a bit closer to the mic if I'm going to talk. Yes. Indeed. Um, if I get a little time, we'll talk about fast forwarding in God's Word. Um, I think the thing that we do at this point now is just hasten to our teacher and, and, and see what our um, lesson study is about this week. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah, okay, very well. Our lesson study will be done this morning by um, a good brother. His name is Elder Matt. We love him. I'm sure he's going to do a wonderful job for us. Welcome him. Good morning. Good morning. Good to be able to come into the house of the Lord, especially when we are contemplating all sorts of things. I don't know how many of you have um, been privileged to hear the message that the Lord blessed us with last Sabbath. And, you know, I've been riding on a high. It's, and I started that, I think the week before, Elder Kip was out and I was task to do Sabbath school and then last week I did the message for the morning I'm back again doing Sabbath school well okay so you guys are making sure that I get my dues paid while I'm in town Amen. <laughs> anyway it's, it's a blessing I, I gotta say that the Lord blessed me with some very interesting encounters throughout the week though they were more what I consider personal. You know, it's amazing that when the Lord promises us that he will do certain things for us, we ought to expect them. We ought to expect the, the fulfillment of God's word. And if you don't expect the fulfillment of God's word, then that means that something is a little bit off with your understanding of how good God is. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it tells us about our faith walk. Now, why is that essential? It's essential because today we're talking about excuses to avoid missions. Mm -hmm. And Elder said something just now. So, whenever God is about to do something, and he did say this. He says, he revealed his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. But he always does tell the prophets and give us a warning. So this quarter, it seems to me, the entire quarter really hinges on the prophet Jonah. 
We're talking about his mission, but more specifically about the preparedness of individuals to carry out that mission. So when you think about this, it, I mean, the question almost begs to be asked, how could Jonah be a prophet of God and miss the most essential characteristic about God, and that's his willingness to intervene when we have a problem, regardless of what the problem is. And of course, in this context, we're thinking about how God goes, or he sends his prophets, or he sends his missionaries to unknown places, oftentimes to a place that they might not always choose to go unless they were sent. And the point behind it is, how do you get a commission to do something and you don't understand the entity that sent you. That's basically what happens here. Jonah is sent, but Jonah does not exemplify that he kept in his mind the character of the person who sent him. So, based on the, the title and also the, the remaining portions of this the lesson as it begun, begin or began sat, Sabbath afternoon, it talks about how he made an excuse. But there is something that I want to point out, and for the sake of time, I like to get us to that. I want to read a supplemental statement for Saturday afternoon, in which it's written by Ellen White, and she says, Nineveh, wicked though it, it had become, was not wholly given over to evil. He who behold all the sons of men and see it every precious thing, perceive in that city many who were reaching out after something better and higher, and who, if granted opportunity to learn of the living God, would put away their evil deeds and worship him. You know, that then becomes something for us to really focus on. We see people, we hear, particularly in the news, most of us get the understanding of the surrounding areas and what we face as Christians. What are you seeing, what are you hearing? It almost begs to make you think that there's no good thing where you live. When you hear of the murders, you hear of all the sorts of things that are happening, you almost miss sight of the fact that there are some people that is actually looking for something better. And so it became the case with Nineveh. It, it had a reputation. And because the Ninevites were a people who were the enemies of Israel and had done quite a bit of harmful things to Israel, is, the Israelites were not prone to want to be missionaries to them. So this was then be, became the case for Jonah. But like it's stated in that statement, Nineveh had quite a bit of people who were really looking for something different. And when you read that story, as you, as you know what ends up happening, you find out that not only were the, the common people interested in something different or looking forward to something different, it actually shows us that the very monarch of the place was looking at what he saw going on and wanted to see a difference. I, I, it makes me think about politicians. Oftentimes we think about those who are courageous enough to stand up and run for public office. And then we have various ideas about them. You know, it was, we see this play out among us how some people favor one candidate, others may favor a different candidate. But what we don't always see is what's going on inside of them. What are they really seeking to accomplish? What do they really want? And so we don't always see how they are asking for change. Maybe they have a different way of seeing it come about. But the fact is, that most of them may very well want change for the better. And then you have the people themselves who are suffering under various 
issues. We don't always know why. Some may be economics, some may be housing, some may be for the loss of loved ones. We don't always know what people are going through. And in each one of these experiences, individuals are looking for something that addresses their need. So having seen what Jonah did, the question then comes to us, do we seek out opportunities to reach people who are in that need, in that space? Or are we neglecting to seek for that opportunity? That's something that, you know, that becomes a question for us to answer. But there's, there's another statement that's made, and I want to read this, which, is, which says, while he, Jonah, hesitated, still doubting after having received the call, Satan overwhelmed him with discouragement. You know, I often tell people, we don't always, because we're not privileged to see the unseen world, we don't get to see, and you, you may have heard somebody talk about a sixth sense. They say we have a sixth sense. Well, I don't see it and don't really think about it as anything specific to us as much as I think about it as there are two forces that are continuously at work, the forces of righteousness and the forces of darkness. We're not privileged to see the, what happens in, in the realm in which the spirit world exists. We can't see it. Doesn't mean though that, it, that it's not there. And oftentimes people think about, the, or they, they have an impression about something and they may react. And they may also actually think that they thought the thoughts. So this morning as we were coming to, to Sabbath school, uh, Claudette said to me, an emergency vehicle is coming, pull over. Well, I saw it, so I didn't really pull over necessarily because the lane in which I was, I moved, it cleared the lane. And nevertheless, as the, as the police went by, she started to talk about how people, whenever they have an emergency vehicle pass them, have a tendency to get behind a vehicle to try to gain an advantage on the distance and the speed with which they can get to a desired location. So they will come behind the emergency vehicle, pass all the cars that were pulled over. And when they do this, they think they've gained. And I said to her, you would be surprised to know how many times the devil literally will tell people to, to do this. Well, she characterized it as a selfish move, which in fact it is. But oftentimes the enemy of souls will encourage people to do stuff that's uncharacteristic of sense. Yes. And they think they thought that thought themselves, not realizing that by following behind uh, an emergency vehicle, to get further up in, uh, ahead of traffic, they could literally be creating a hazardous situation. Yes. And, when it ha and if it does happen, if the people who were in the front didn't see what the person following the emergency vehicle did, they, if they had not seen it, could very well end up in a tragic experience. To which when it does happen, the enemy laughs because the people think that they thought the thoughts themselves. So here Jonah is sitting, and he's now being, being encouraged to be doubtful and to be discouraged. And with that, he gets up and he makes a detour from where he's being sent to a totally different place. You know, um, I want to read something else that's a part of the uh, supplement reading. God did not work exclusively through any one class. Well, I think I missed something. But anyway, I'm going to continue reading it. Daniel was a prince of Judah. Isaiah was of the royal line. David was a shepherd boy. 
Amos, a herdsman, Zechariah, a captive from Babylon, Elisha, a tiller of the soil. The Lord raises up as, he, as his representatives, prophets and princes, the noble and the lowly, and taught them the truths to be given to the world. To everyone who becomes a partaker of his grace, the Lord appoints a work for others. You know, I was um, thinking about, okay. I was thinking about uh, what happened in this narrative as we r r read through it. And um, there was something that came up and I think that it's, it's not something that we miss necessarily, but you know Jonah was told to go. And sometimes this story kind of causes us to look at some things. Maybe we might catch it and ask the right kind of question. Like for instance, why, why would the Lord allow Jonah to, well, first of all, well, yeah. Why would the Lord allow Jonah to actually go in a different direction with all of his intentions. Oh, I need a microphone. Can, choice. Can, I have a voice. Choice. Okay, he says choice. That's true. That is. Um, I want to explore that, that answer. I want to come back to that. I'm going to try to come back to that. <laughs> I hope I can remember what my impressions are. Um, yeah, okay, so the question is, why would the Lord allow Jonah to go, to get up after, after he decided what he's going to do, which we know is contrary to God's direction, yes. right? But why would the Lord allow Jonah to actually get up and begin the, 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 the journey towards Joppa? Why would he allow him to go that far? What you need a we need to pass the microphone. I got one right here. Yeah. Okay. It's free will. Yeah, free will. People need to hear it. Because God loves him, he gave, he's patient enough to let him mess around before he does the right thing. But I want to say that when God calls you, do you, does he call you like personally say to you in your dreams or tell you where to go or are you supposed to just guess that he's calling you? Good question. Can you pass the mic? Okay. Thank you. For the love of God, we were created. And for the love of us, there was a way out of for us. Mm-hmm. Okay. I also believe that in God calling jo Jonah and choosing him to go to Nineveh, it was not only for Jonah to go to Nineveh, but there were lessons that Jonah need to learn who God is and what he say, he means it. And it does not matter how much he deviate, he will have to do, but he had to learn the lesson that God needed him to learn for him to do what he needs him to do. Amen. Anyone else? Okay, so, you know, um, this, this narrative, begs to ask how God communicates with you, okay? So you, you see the story. Well, I, I have a belief that when God says something, he doesn't have to change his mind, okay? He doesn't have to change his mind. I think I told a story once, well, in describing the call of Moses to go to Egypt and, and Moses is showing reluctancy. Oh, I don't wanna go. Uh, I can't speak. And he has all these excuses. So the Lord said, okay, I'm, I'm going to send your brother Aaron with you. He'll be your mouthpiece. So you let him go down and speak. So, okay. So we see this going on. But what does God know? Okay, so before 
Jeremiah would come on the scene because you know Moses precedes Jeremiah. And you know from Jeremiah's experience, Jeremiah said, I'm not telling Israel anything else. Why? Because they don't listen and they, they, they persecute me for telling them the truth and for help, trying to help them to be saved from all of the destructions that could come. So Jeremiah got upset. He decided, I'm not saying anything else to them. And then he comes back later and he testifies. And what does he say? God's word was in him like what? Fire shut up in the bones. In other words, he couldn't keep his peace. God knows that whenever his word gets in us, when we become serious about wanting to do what God asks us to do, his word has life changing effects. So he didn't have to argue with Moses, okay? Okay, Moses, I will send Aaron, you just go. And you know what happened to Moses after a while? Moses was not allowing Aaron to do all the talking. Yes. <laughs> and that's basically what happened. But, but looking back at Jonah, Jonah again. So the Lord is having us, have, he, he gave Jonah a, a, a mission, go to Nineveh, to Nineveh. Um, Jonah sits and he's now despondent. The devil is actually there telling him, don't do it. You don't have to worry about it. You need to go somewhere else. So Jonah jumps up and he decides he's going to go somewhere else. And the question was, why isn't God having an ongoing dialogue with Jonah through this experience? And Sister Map said it right. God is seeking to teach us humility. If he tells you something, your, it's necessary for your faith, the building of your courage, the building of your belief, and, and knowledge of his ability to work through you to accomplish his purpose. So, yes, and it does require you accepting the call. That's your choice. You can choose to accept it or you could choose to reject it. I, I tell um, friends of mine oftentimes when we're talking, just because the Lord call you and tell you to do something don't mean you have to do it. But there's a consequence for everything that we don't do as well as there's a consequence for everything that we do. But I want to get to this point about in this part of this lesson that one of the reasons why I believe that the Lord allowed Jonah to get up and to go is because when Jonah got to the boat, he had no idea that was his first mission field. See, God is in the business of saving people. Yes. And wherever his people are, they have a responsibility to share something of the love of God and his desire to save people. So the men on that boat needed the, the message of salvation too. Yes. And since Jonah volunteered unwittingly to go be a missionary to those guys on that boat, he, he did this without thinking about it, took himself to a different mission field and after he completed the task God arranged for a passage for Jonah to get back on the way where he was originally sent and what what was that passage that you're discussing <laughs> it was a very large fish, fish. that's true <laughs> I'll tell you something that's funny funny it's not though but it is funny I used to like, and I still do actually like it, but, I, but I'm curbing my, my views away from certain things. But I, I like some scientific uh, type stories because I usually see in a lot of movies what man is thinking about wishing he could accomplish. And believe it or not, a lot of what you see, they are accomplishing them. But one of the things that, that one of the stories that I've, Look, took, uh, took humor in it was honey I shrunk the kids right and th th so, th so this, looking at the story of Jonah you just said God created a very large fish either that or he shrunk Jonah <laughs> now that sounds funny a little bit right but let me tell you actually you see in any time God gives us a command to do something Whenever he tells us what we are supposed to do, 
and we choose to go contrary to it, God has to bring us how? Down. He has to reduce us, get self out of the way in order for his will for you to be accomplished. And I have discovered that we really don't understand something about the call. And I think some many years ago, as I was sitting down thinking about some work, there, there was a town that uh, called Athens, several miles away from Huntsville. And when we were students, I had to apply for food stamps one day. And it turned out that, that somehow I missed the appointment, but walked in and the caseworker that had my case came out to see me and said, you missed your appointment, but I'm going to give you five minutes. And I said, okay. And I went to her office for the five minute interview so that we could get food stamps to feed ourselves and our newborn son. And it turned out that what was supposed to be five minutes turned out to be five, no, 45 minutes. And what turned out to be 45 minutes would eventually lead to a new church in a different town. Th this was one of the most remarkable revelations of God's work I have ever witnessed. And I don't know if I've ever seen anything like quite like that since. And what I said, and at the end of all of that experience, I said, we are only sent to witness the event of God saving people. When the Lord tells us to go on a mission, we are sent just to witness the event. And the good thing about this is, we get credit as though this was our work. I mean, there, there is no beating the goodness of God. Um, some, somewhere, I think I learned a song that said, you just can't beat God's giving no matter how hard you try. And this is true. So I, I think about this. Uh, Jonah leaves, now he leaves the boat. <laughs> Unwillingly, he leaves the boat. He, a fish swallows him and deposits him on land where he can now begin the journey towards Nineveh. And so he goes. But can, he, I, can I interrupt yes, just one please, more second? Yes, go ahead. You were on to such a fantastic idea about the second, the, the first uh, mission field right. that Jonah didn't want to participate in. And that was with those sailors. sailors. Mm -hmm. And they prayed to their gods yeah. who were of stone and metal wood. and wood. wood. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work. Wow. And so then they said, Lord God, what can we do? And that's when they remembered Jonah. And where is he? He's down in the hold, sleeping. Mm -hmm. So then they rush down there and say, there's only one person that this could, could be from, and that is your God. Right. And he said, yes, I am the reason you're going through all this. <laughs> you need to throw me overboard. Yeah, I'm glad you did that. And, and so they said, no, 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 we can't do that. So then what happened was they brought him on board and I mean, uh, up above, up deck. at the top. And then they saw that the wind was blowing even harder mm -hmm. and the, bo the, the boat was listing further. And so then they said, and Jonah said, you must throw me in. And so then they measured everything and they said, okay, we'll do this. We didn't want the responsibility of throwing someone in and then, and then have it come back on us. But, uh, and Jonah says, it's my God who is doing this. Mm -hmm. And if you throw me in that water, 
this will clear. Mm -hmm. And so they finally realized they had to do that. And so they threw him overboard. And what happened to that storm? Cease. It immediately calmed. Okay. Immediately. Mm -hmm. that, that's a blessing. I'm glad you did that, though. You know, sometimes, you, and you, you experience this all the time, you can't always follow where you, where you start, but I'm glad you brought that out. This brother has a comment. I would like to conjecture that maybe they were praying to God all along through their idolization of the metal and wood that God created. Mm. Because God created yeah. all things for man. So if we change our perspective a certain way, the power of idols could be construed in a positive way. We have po positive idols up on stage right now, mm -hmm. but they are not idols in the sense of religion. They are idols in the sense of the feeling that they give us positive regard towards our Lord. Um, Richard. Is there someone over here? Richard, Richard. Oh, Richard. What you're all saying is great. But there's one little thing that's been missing in verse 9 of chapter 1. Mm -hmm. He said, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Yeah. That's a critical part of this whole story. Mm -hmm. Now he's witnessing. Now he's explaining what's going on, which they didn't have. Yeah. Excellent thought. Yes. You know, that's exactly right. Um, in that experience, they actually had a witness of the true God. It's, um, you know, one of the things that I thought about beyond this, this story is... It would be, and maybe something I could find, I don't know, but I thought about it. I'm wondering now, pretty much if, you, if you're familiar with the story of the Ethiopian eunuch who Philip was, was told to go up in his chariot and share this, the, the gospel of Christ. Yes. We are told historically that when that eunuch got back to Ethiopia, he started a complete movement. And I believe that when people have encounters like the one Jonah had with those guys on that boat, I don't think that they left, they, they were left the way they started out. Because when something profound happens to you, and, and you all may have seen this, if something profound occur in your life, it, you can't help but tell somebody. And yes, Brother Wolf. Oh, I, mine is more or less a question, you know? I, I said we all don't have the mentality of Isaiah. You know, Isaiah just spoke up when the Lord called him. He said, here am I, Lord, send me. And I, I think a lot of times we, we, God has to put us through something to get us. We have to pass through something to get us on the right path. Mm -hmm. That's right. There is, a, um, there is a statement that's made in the, in the Monday, on the Monday lesson, the two things, and I want to look at those. One of them, in the, in the first paragraph under the, under the Bible reading says, the wind and the waves belong to God, the fish too. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, Psalm 24 and verse one. Jonah's heart was turned to the sovereign of earth and sea, and so he confessed and was saved. That's what happened to Jonah in the, in the belly of the fish. I said something, and, and this is, he repented, yeah. yeah, he repented. And that's, that's the theme. For me, now, I have an a, a going, ongoing theme that I, and I've, I've experienced it. And I know the power of God's saving grace. If we would but just ask him every morning, ask God to change your heart, change your life and give you the new birth experience. Pray and ask him to do it. That's it. 
you would be amazed at what God will do. Because, you know, there is so much that God knows going forward, okay? Like the Apostle Paul. You see the Apostle Paul carrying out the work of the Sanhedrin by killing Christians, persecuting them, imprisoning them, killing them, whatever it took to stamp out this, this pestilence, according to them. And you see the Lord allowing this to take place. And one day, Jesus decides, I'm going to stop him here. You read, you know, one of the things that we don't often confront people with this, but it is true. When Jesus walked on the earth, there was no such thing as the four gospels. When Jesus walked on the earth, there was no such thing as a New Testament. The whole message of salvation was, was written for everyone, all in what we, con we consider today to be the Old Testament. So if the message of salvation and grace was in the Old Testament, and that is what Jesus used to combat the devil and gave his disciples to do the same, when we look at the stories of the New Testament today, those stories are witnesses to us about how to be missionaries. The stories of the Old Testament basically tells us what has to happen. And particularly if you read the book of Deuteronomy, it definitely lets you know you need a new life. So unfortunately, the people of Israel didn't quite understand that in order to carry out what God is telling them to carry out, they need to have a new life. Something has to happen, Brother Wolf. Uh, I was just going because I'm thinking Jonah problem was his previous life what he understood about God and what was God asking him to do they didn't seem to be in harmony um, I think Jonah felt that he was betraying everything that he'd been taught and everything that he learned and his friends to go to Nineveh. Mm. And, 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 and like you said, born again experience was key. His key is always key to put us on the right track. Uh, I mean, Jonah, he wasn't going to be able to face his friends no more. And that wasn't the only case. If we think about the case with Peter, when um, God sent Peter to Joppa, Peter was the first apostle to go to the Gentiles. Yeah. And Peter was pretty apprehensive about going there too. And um, matter of fact, I heard you, you drift back a little bit about the history of Israel, but if James and John wouldn't have been at the head of the church, I don't know if Peter would have made it back. Those people wouldn't accept Peter back after going, after going to the Gentiles. That's true. And God sent him on that mission, but he went on that mission anyway. But in, I don't want to... Well, in, in the case of Peter, Peter set the standard for the in, entire um, Christian movement. Yeah, that Christian movement. Yeah, that's what he did. Yeah, you know, um, what? Okay. One minute. We're coming. Thank you. You know, I think something we're missing out about um, Jonah. Jonah was more fearful for his life than anything else to go to Nineveh because of what he know in the past how they do people. Yeah. How they, they were very dreadful, very notorious in how they um, kill them. 
So he did not want no part because he was fearful for his life that he was going to be slain. Amen. Amen. Every call of God comes with a threat. <laughs> Believe it or not. Yeah, every call of God comes with a threat. And we don't realize how severe and serious that, that statement I just made is. You know how many people have gotten up? Okay, this, this one is re real easy, obvious, right? So, so people got up to go to work one day. And like every other day, they just assume that it's going to go follow a script. Right through, I'm going to do my work, and then I'm going to get on the transportation back home, not knowing that a jet is going to fly into the building. How do you, how do you go... Um, so when people say, I don't have faith, I don't have enough faith. Really, you don't? Why'd you get out of it? Why'd you come out of your house? Yes. Why did you get out of your bed? Because when you woke up, you were still alive and you were safe, right? There was no danger in the bed from which you could tell. Why'd you get up? Because now you're going to face uncertainties. Why would you get in your vehicle and drive it? Did you te check the brakes to make sure that the car is going to stop? So, and also, I, I feel not only the fear that he had, mm -hmm. but there's something else. When people are fearful of you, they become prejudiced. Yeah, that's a good And point. there's no doubt that he was prejudiced. These were not his people. Right. These were those terrible people who kill and murder and steal. Mm. And yet, you expect me to go and try and save them? <laughs> and then he says to God, but I know something about you. You will, if they repent, you will allow them salvation. How can I allow that? This is who you are. I know you, God. Well, I think that he thought that, yes, it will take something because my people are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Mm. How about, Is that right? How about they're going to become defiled? Yeah. How about them becoming defiled? Mm -hmm. You know, um, coming home, bring it home now. I would think, you know, there are some of us in our faith and we've been in, we have been brought up, born in an Adventist home, right? We come to church and we look at ourselves and think that we hone this faith, okay? And so when other people come in and they get position, some of us become so puffed up and so indignant. How dare them give them a position and so we who are like that eventually some of us become so bad that we walk away from our faith because we think we are God gift and we should get everything receive everything but we should not share it and that is the problem and we make all kinds of excuses why we shouldn't do what God has called us to do but when he calls us, he gives us a command. Go ye therefore and teach all nation. I'm going to uh, read another statement. It says, establish in your heart, establish your hearts in the belief that God knows of all the trials and difficulties you will encounter in the warfare against evil. For God is dishonored when any soul ben belittles his power by taking or talking unbelief. Go ahead. I just want to say, today we see Israel over there fighting with the Palestinians, so they must not have Messiah, Jesus Christ, in their heart, because Jesus said, love your enemy. 
So if they listen to Jesus Christ who says, love your enemy, they would get along with the Palestinians for his name's sake. That's all I have to say. Yes, point. There's enough hate. There's enough hatred and arguments to go around. Anyways, this statement was made, but I'm going to read it for the sake of emphasis. It says, "Like Jonah, we sometimes harbor prejudice that keep that keep us from reaching out to persons or groups, having to fit to face our prejudices requires humility." Mission also requires time and emotional energy. Investing in others' lives and truly caring for them can be taxing. And that's true. If you think about what you just said about what's going on in the Middle East, you, we know that, interestingly enough, Israel was given a charge. The, the people were told what their mission to the world was supposed to be. The, the question begs to be asked, if you claim to be a peculiar people to God if you make that claim and you say we are the people who God called and he favors us about all if you say that okay so what about what about all of the other instructions you were given right so if you are claiming to be a, a, spe a specific people then what are you a specific people for and then the question has to be asked are you fulfilling it that's what you're talking about. Um, every soul who is saved must surrender his own plans and follow where Christ leads the way. The understanding must be yielded up to Christ for him to cleanse and refine and purify. And that's my theme again. We are told the understanding must be yielded up to Christ for him to cleanse and refine and purify. This will always be done when we receive aright the teaching of Christ. Oh, how much we need a more intimate acquaintance with him. We need to enter into his purpose and to carry out his will, save, saying with the whole heart, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And that's basically it. Our daily prayer should always be, Lord, what will you have me to do today? That's what we should always pray. And while we're waiting for Brother Wolf to come back to the front so he can carry on with what he started, I want to take a moment to just read another quote. Christ's ambassadors are to point men to the nobler world, which has largely been lost sight of. And that's basically the problem. People, either they don't know or they've lost sight of the fact that we have a mission and we're supposed to point people to a nobler place. With all the sorrow, with all the, the, the burdens, the hardships that we go through in this life, all of the disappointments, we have a responsibility to tell people this is not the end. No matter what it, what you think about this, this is not the end. And, uh, you know, w when it comes down to, to the idea about politics and political pursuits and all this so these sorts of things, I always think about the fact that we, we, we forget, as Christians, we forget that Jesus prayed a prayer that we are to be left in the world but not of the world. And because we tend to forget that, we get caught up, I think often, in too much in the fabric of the world. Because we forget that we have to represent something different. And we have to show people a different way. Brother Elder, when you're ready to come up. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing that too. So, um, that's something that we need to remember. That we are not, we're not to get caught up in, in the same thing that other people are caught up in. That tends to, to draw their attention away from 
what's the most important thing. And that's preparing and being ready for when Jesus actually come back. Um, you know, I, I said something once before too, talking about praying for the second coming, or not the second coming, praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We talk about that. Lord, we want the, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But we're missing what caused the outpouring of the Holy Spirit the first time. What caused the outpouring of the Holy Spirit the first time is going to be required for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit the second time. Amen. Study what, it, what they did that caused that to happen and we can expect then to see the same thing. Um, having said that, when we talk about, we pray, we want Jesus to come. We want Jesus to come, really. I'm wondering if when we make statements like that, are we really thinking about what has to occur? And I'm not being necessarily cowardice, but I'm gonna tell you the truth personally. I personally don't think that I wanna see what we're told is the time of trouble. Okay? If, if we're told that the, the, the things that are going to occur, we can't even imagine it, l let me tell you, I'm gonna make it real easy for a lot of us. If you have children, if you have daughters, and we're told that we can't even imagine how bad it can get, Think about how bad something could happen to your female members of your family and then ask the question again or be asked the question, are you sure you're ready for Jesus to come? Because for him to come, these things must take place first. I don't want to see that. So we talk about stuff. But the question is, do we really know what we're asking for? And some of you have said this to people, be careful what you pray for. Anyways, Elder. Go ahead. Mission Report Strangled by an Invisible Hand Theophan was getting ready to go to school in Guinea when he felt someone or something strangle his throat. As he looked around, he found no one in sight. Terrified, he ran until he could breathe again. But that was just the beginning. Every now and then, when he least expected it, he felt an invisible hand close around his throat. Theophan's father took him to two different hospitals, but the doctors said he had no problem. Then Theophan was taken to a psychiatrist. However, he prescribed drugs and they did nothing. It was at this point that he heard a voice whisper in his ear, go to church, but Theophan didn't understand anything. He had gone to church on Sundays as a child and saw no reason to go back, so he ignored the voice. But the attacks kept on happening and the voice was insistent, go to church. Theophan began to wonder if God was communicating with him and decided to read the Bible. From then on, he started sleeping better at night, something he hadn't been able to do in a while. And because of that, he went back to church with his family on Sundays. It was then that his uncle invited him to visit the Adventist church, and the boy accepted. Theophan's uncle was a global mission pioneer in Guinea and realized that his own nephew needed help. In the church, Theophan felt peace, a peace that he had never felt before, and the demonic possessions diminished over time until they finally ceased. 
Theophan learned more and more about the Bible and God and saw that the church preached the truth, so he was baptized shortly afterwards. Thank you for your mission offerings three years ago that helped expand the Adventist Church in Guinea. And in this quarter, we will help expand the Adventist Nursing and Midwifery Training College in Ghana. Let's give generously. I think the first thing I need to go back and just kind of thank Elder Doug for what a beautiful study. Yeah. I like the way that he laid the foundation and then he got everybody involved. I thought it was very good. Um, the Sabbath School Council is going to have to come together because there are those who say that we don't have a beautiful flow that um, we be taking up offering during the time the study is going on and nobody want to break their trend of thought so we're just going to have to come together and organize this just a little bit better maybe even um the mission stories immediately after cyber school before we can get a chance to say thanks to everybody for participating and and maybe find out if there's a, a thought that is important that is lingering. Well, anyway, with that said, it's just, I just want to let you know that that plans are, are in motion to improve Sabbath school if we can a little bit. Um, I wish I could do something to help improve the attendance. <laughs> but anyway, you have a few people here to study the Word of God and I say praise the Lord for them. Um, oh, the thought for the day. I, I have to stay here because the mic is here. Um, I had two different thoughts. Somebody had told me, said I needed to say something about, about you know, mission and excuses. <laughs> But we studied it pretty well. You know, I always felt that uh, something about excuses. I don't know if you have noticed that excuses, uh, whether the mission or wherever, excuses only help the person that makes them. Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> if I owed Mr. Jim a hundred dollars. And I went to him and told him, I said, Mr. Jim, I don't have your money. I, my car broke down and I had to spend my money. I had to spend it on my car. You see, that seemed like a, a good excuse, doesn't it? What, is the, what, what does it do for Mr. Jim? It doesn't help him. He still don't have the $100. Yeah. It just helps me. So I, 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 I think... It's a poor thing or a bad thing to really make excuses. Maybe you should um, just say, sorry, I don't have it. And hold on to our excuses. I don't know any place where, unless somebody wants some excuse, unless they ask you, could you give me an excuse? I don't see anywhere where excuse is really appropriate. How much time do I have? I'll go back to my text for a half a minute. Just want to show you one thing. I, 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 five minutes? Three minutes? <laughs> well, I'm just going to show you one thing in the text. Put it up there again. Um, it's Revelations 12, 10 and 11. Let us read it again. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, the kingdom of our God, and the 
and the power of his strife. For the accuser of our brethren has cast them out, which accused them day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Man, man, man. And I had entitled a thought, a very brief thought of, of did anybody hear what I said? Yeah. What was it? Fast forward. I think God fast forward us in time in this, in this thought here to show us what the standard is for overcoming. If you plan to be on that kingdom of Christ that it talks about right there, how do they overcome? They love not their lives unto the death. Those two things, think about the blood of the lamb and the word of his testimony. Now, you know, uh, this is really a part of a uh, of a giant sermon because I would have to sit here and, and talk about what it means to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and what it means to overcome by the word of his testimony. What is the Bible trying to tell us? But the Bible, one thing the Bible is trying to tell us that those who overcame the, those who that was on that kingdom with Christ they had overcome they were there because of those two things the blood of the lamb and the word of his testimony so you can you can handle it from there if you plan to be on that in that kingdom with Christ then you need to look into those two things and make sure you have them. If you got anything else, you ain't gonna make it. But you need the word. And the blood. Okay, we can close now. Let us stand. Our closing psalm says what? Yes, blessed assurance. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fortress of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Oh. Uh -huh.
fixed of mission. All is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking. With his mess, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song Praising Amen Kind and loving Heavenly Father We just want to thank you for For our experience we had this morning With you there Lord we pray there, Lord, that those things that we have considered, may we not just keep them to ourselves there, Lord. May we continue to share them all week. That's why they are placed in our hearts and our minds. And we just want to thank you for the study this morning. And we know there, Lord, as the week goes on, the Holy Spirit is just going to open up more thought about it to us, make us understand it better. And we pray that, Father, that you continue to be with us. Again, remember those who are in transit, who will be with us very shortly. Bless them, their Lord, and bless us as well this morning. In Jesus' holy name, amen. And thank you, their Lord.